agenda. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. You have been emailed a copy of the minutes of the 2020 RNC organizational meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina. Without objection, we will dispense with the reading of the minute, minutes. Hearing no objection, I call upon the committee to approve the minutes from the 2020 organizational meeting. Again, without objection, the minutes are approved. At this time, we have a new member to ratify, and I'm pleased to announce the election of Rita, Rita Hamilton, National Committee Woman for Arkansas. It is someone we know who's been here before. It is stipulated in rule number four that the election of new National Committee men or women to fill the vacancies in the Republican National Committee shall be ratified by the RNC upon their election by their state Republican Party. Do I hear a motion to ratify the election of our new National Committee member, Rita Hamilton? The motion is made. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded that we ratify the election of our new member. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, signify by saying no. The ayes have it. And I am pleased to officially welcome Rita Hamilton as a member of the Republican National Committee. Welcome back. It is my pleasure to welcome three new state chairmen to the Republican National Committee. Frank Bordeaux, Mississippi. Please stand when I say your name. Jonelle Fulmer, Arkansas, and Michael Lavery from New Jersey. I congratulate each of you on your election and welcome you all as members of the Republican National Committee. Each region held, bre each region held elections at their breakfast this morning. Please hold applause until I have announced all the winners. The results are as follows. The following members were elected to serve as vice chairman. Midwestern Region, Mary Boostrin, National Committee Woman from, Ar from Wisconsin, and Stephen Scheffler, National Committee Man for Iowa. Northeastern Region, Virginia Haynes, National Committee Woman for New Jersey, and John Fry, National Committee Man for Connecticut. Southern Region, Cindy Costa, National Committee Woman for South Carolina, and Robin Armstrong, National Committee Man from Texas. And the Western Region, Harmeet Dillon, National Committee Woman for California, and Caleb Heimlich, State Chairman for Washington. The following members were elected to the Executive Committee. Midwestern Region, Jennifer Carnahan, State Chairwoman for Minnesota, and John Hammond, National Committee Man, Indiana. Northeastern Region, Henry McCann, National Committee Man for Delaware, and Leora Levy, National Committee Woman for Connecticut. Southern Region, Beth Campbell, National Committee Woman for Tennessee, and Jonathan Barnett, National Committee Man for Arkansas, and Western Region, Rear Ortegon, National Committee Woman for Colorado, and Sean Steele, National Committee Man from California. The following members were elected to the Budget Committee. Midwestern Region, region Kim Borchers, National Committee Woman for Kansas, Kyle Hupfer, State Chairman, Indiana. Northeastern Region, Christine Toretti, National Committee Woman for Pennsylvania. Steve Frias, National Committee Man, Rhode Island. Southern Region, Tony Ann DeShiel, National Committee Woman for Texas, and Glenn McCall, National Committee Man for South Carolina. Western Region, Cindy Sidaway, National Committee Woman for Idaho, and Steve Pierce, State Chairman for New Mexico. The following members were elected to the Resolutions Committee. Midwestern Region, region Tamara Scott, National Committee Woman for Iowa, and Shane Gettle, National Committee Man for North, North Dakota. Northeastern Region, Leanne Sinek, National Committee Woman for Rhode Island, and Nick Langworthy, State Chairman of New York. Southern Region, Patty Lyman, National Committee Woman for Virginia, and Paul Reynolds, National Committee Man for Alabama. Western Region, Jessica Patterson, State Chairman for California, and Jean Ward, National Committee Man for Hawaii. Congratulations to all of you on your elections. So I get to give my report now, and I am so grateful to see all of you here in Amelia Island, Florida. We were hoping to be here this summer for our convention, but we finally made it. It's so great to see you all. Thank you for coming. I also want to begin by thanking many of the people in this room, so please uh, allow me the latitude to, to do that. And first, I have to start with my co-chairman, Tommy Hicks, who's been a warrior traveling this country far and wide. We all know I broke my ankle a couple weeks ago, and actually a week ago, and Tommy had to go knock a lot more doors because of that. Um, but he's been fighting in the freedom, uh, in the battle for freedom, and to win over hearts and minds. And he's a great partner to work with. And all of us are lucky to have him in our party. I also want to thank, and I hope you will join me, 
and thanking our incredible RNC staff who have worked so hard. And they're all around the room. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. I'm so proud of our team. Many of them, actually pretty much everyone was in Georgia, missing Thanksgiving, knocking doors. I'm so proud of our whole staff and our chief of staff, Richard Walters, who has just done a phenomenal job. Thank you, Richard. Our dedicated member service team, and I think you all know they're phenomenal. Mariana Herrera, Callie Estes, Sarah Valdez, and Madeline Fennell. Thank you, thank you. You guys are the best, so thank you. And also our finance chairman for the Republican National Committee, Todd Ricketts, a dear friend of mine who has just uh, been a great partner to work with and given hours and hours of his time to make sure that our party is successful. And we could not do so, all the things that we've done without Todd. Uh, I especially want to thank my husband and my kids. Abigail and Nash are not here. They have school right now. Nash is very busy in virtual ceramics right now. It is. A really taxing class for him. Um, if you want to know how you do virtual ceramics from home, he's got Metalworks next semester, so we'll be curious to see how that works. Um, but they really can't miss school right now. Uh, but last four years ago, when I was uh, first being elected, you know, Nash was here, and he's here now. And I, you've all heard my horror stro stories about driving with my 15-year-old. Um, but I, I love them; they're phenomenal. And my husband Patrick is here. And I just can't thank you all for the warm welcome you give him. But more than that, uh, he is my rock. And he is just the best husband, partner, father, friend anyone could have. I love you, Patrick. Thank you for everything. I have no idea where you are, but thank you. <clears throat> Before I begin my remarks today, I do want to address the terrible events that took place at our Capitol this week. This committee condemned, rightly condemned, the violence that occurred in the strongest possible terms. Violence does not represent acts of patriotism, but an attack on our country and its founding principles. Our founding fathers established a nation of laws, not a nation of anarchy. It especially hit home this week with the incredible frightening bomb scare that we had at the RNC on the same exact day. We need this to stop. The violence needs to stop. And as the leader of the Republican Party, please don't do this. We can do things peacefully, and that is the path we need to take. I want to thank our amazing security team who handled the situation at the RNC with professionalism and for always working tirelessly to keep us all safe. As the transition of power continues over the next two weeks, I call on individuals to respect law enforcement, law and order, and our great system of governance. Now, we, when I began this journey as RNC chairwoman four years ago, I knew, I knew, and many of you told me, I had big shoes to fill. I also knew I wanted to put my own stamp on the party and take on big projects that would set us up for success in 2020 and beyond. It goes without saying that when all of us met this time last year, None of us could have imagined everything the coming year would throw at us. From planning our nominating convention, not once, not twice, but three times, to the other countless challenges we faced this past year, 2020 put us all to the test. And of course, the greatest challenge of all has been the loss of friends and family members to this horrific virus. Yet through it all, through it all, each of you have never wavered in the face of adversity. All of you stepped up to the plate and carried out our mission with conviction. And because you did, we accomplished so many of the things we set out to do. We raised the most money ever in the history of our party. We coalesced around one platform to drive small dollar donations by launching WinRed. Even in its infancy, WinRed has proven successful beyond our wildest dreams. We've raised more than $2 billion in just a year and a half uh, with WinRed, something it took Democrats a full 14 years to do with their small dollar donation platform. We built the biggest, largest political infrastructure ever, talking to more voters, 182 million of them, than any other campaign in history. And our data-driven ground game turned out millions more Republicans 
than ever, and it set the standard by which future campaigns will be judged. One of the things I am most proud of is how we stepped up to engage minority communities and expand our party this election cycle. You cannot win votes if you do not ask for them. And this cycle, we made an unprecedented effort to meet voters where they are and invest in their communities. We opened community centers dedicated to engaging black, Latino, and Hispanic Americans and amplifying Republicans' winning message. The nearly 10,000 events our Trump Victory Strategic Initiatives team held this cycle included events aimed at engaging Asian Pacific Americans, Black Americans, and Hispanic Americans. We held our TVLIs in 14, 14 different languages, including Vietnamese, Hindi, Haitian, Creole, Hmong, and Greek, and Portuguese, just to name a few. We dovetailed our community events with an aggressive media strategy that included 2,000 bookings in black media outlets and more than 1,300 interviews for RNC officials and surrogates on Hispanic TV and radio stations across the country. And our message resonated. And the years-long investment we made was a big part of the reason President Trump earned the highest share of minority votes for a Republican in 60 years. Over a quarter of his support in this election came from non-white voters. He significantly broadened his base among black voters, winning close to 20% of black men and more than doubling his support with black women. We saw similar trends with Hispanic voters and Asian Americans, and there is no doubt that he has redrawn the political map for our party and proved that we can compete and win in non-traditionally Republican communities. Building on our minority engagement efforts, we also held a different kind of convention last summer that showcased a more diverse, representative Rep Republican party. Americans saw we are a big tent party, a party the president helped expand and one that now looks more like the rest of America. While we are disappointed about the races that we lost, and I know we're disappointed, we also saw important wins for Republicans across the country. Contrary to what every political pundit in the Beltway bubble was predicting and not so secretly hoping for, no blue wave materialized on election day. As we learn, every election, candidates matter. And in November, Americans across uh, the country elected Republicans with compelling life stories to the House of Representatives. Two of those are young Kim and Michelle Steele. We all know Michelle Steele because she's married to our National Committee man from California, Sean Steele. They were both... Both women were born abroad, and they knew each other while raising their kids here in America. And they saw firsthand how Democrat policies of high taxes combined with crippling government regulations were crushing small businesses and the American dream in their Southern California communities. They realized they couldn't afford to sit on the sidelines. And this week, this week, they became the first two Korean American women to be seated in the United States Congress. For Americans who are sick and tired of hearing about AOC and the rest of the socialist squad, we have great news. That's because we now have our own squad, the Freedom Squad, made up of people who know firsthand the perils of socialism in practice. People like Nicole Maliotakis, Carlos Jimenez, Maria Salazar, and Victoria Sparks, who will be on the front lines defending freedom and standing up to Speaker Pelosi's extreme agenda every single day. It's, it's also fitting and a point of pride for me that in the year we celebrated the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote, a cause championed by Republicans, our country voted to send a record number of women to Congress. These reasons, these reasons and the speakers we had last night and the things we are seeing here give me every cause to be confident and optimistic about the future of our party as we begin this new year. While we incur are encouraged by our track record in competitive House and other down-ballot races, we are disappointed with the results as elsewhere. And I've said a few times this week, and I know this probably isn't proper English, but I am pissed. I am pissed about losing critical elections. I'm so mad. 
And it's okay because we're going to take that into 2022. And we have a lot of hard work to do to take back the Senate and the House in 2022. But I am mad, and I am not going to let socialism rule in this country. And I'm going to work with every single one of you to make sure we squash it, we take back the House, and we take back the Senate in 2022. We are not. We are not going to cede our country to the far left who want to turn towards socialism, institute the Green New Deal, and remake America as we know it, and take away my right to call myself a mother, a wife, a sister, a woman. Give me a break. So Democrats, get ready, buckle your seatbelts, because we are coming. And before I end, I want to say, and I want to say this sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, how proud I am to serve in this role as RNC chairman of the Republican Party, because yes, we are the Republican Party at this pivotal point in our nation's history. RNC chairs have included governors, speakers of the House, senators, and even a future president. And I will always be forever grateful to President Trump and all of you for believing in me and giving me this opportunity of a lifetime. I love the RNC, and I love the Republican Party and what we stand for, and I know that the best is yet to come for us. We are the steady ship in the storm, and we are there for our candidates when they need them. And it is now up to us to keep that ship on course and together build a stronger institution than ever. I love the opportunity to work with each and every one of you. You are my friends. You are my family. I appreciate your constructive cr criticism. I appreciate your efforts, the volunteerism, the things that you're doing to strive to make our nation better. People who take on the sacrifices of being an RNC member, you do it joyfully because you believe in your heart that the causes and values we're fighting for are the right ones. Most of all, I love the RNC because it gives me an opportunity in some small way back, small way to give back to the country we all love. And because this land of liberty we are likely to call home is still worth fighting for, let us not grow weary in doing good as scripture, scripture teaches, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Thank you again for being willing to step up and serve as RNC members. May God bless each and every one of you. May God bless your families. And may God bless the greatest nation on earth, the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our chairman, co-chairman, Tommy Hicks, for the purpose of giving his report. Thank you for that introduction, Rana. And would you please join me one more time and give Rana, our great chairwoman, one more round of applause. <laughs> With Rana at the helm, we've made historic strides here at the RNC. She's an inspiration and one of the hardest workers I've ever known. Rana and I have proven that we make a great team. We work really hard but we also have fun. I also want to thank Todd Ricketts, our finance chairman. Uh, he was a huge part of us breaking fundraising records, which helped us invest in our party. I'd like to thank our treasurer, Ron Kaufman, and our secretary, Vicki Drummond, and Doyle Webb, our general counsel. Thanks for your service. I also want to thank our outstanding staff here, starting with Richard Walters. Thank you, Richard and our outstanding member services team, uh, Mariana, Callie, Sarah, and Madeline. Thank you very much. I also want to thank my team, starting with my chief of staff, Ann Pierce, one of the uh, best people I've worked with in my 20-plus year career, and uh, also 
Amanda Smith, who's not with us today, but Roderick Patton, uh, they will go on to do great things for our nation. Uh, so thank you, team. I would also like to thank my wife and my family who moved to Washington, D.C. with me from Dallas, Texas, and gave me the flexibility to serve this party. Uh, my wife, Alex, is here today. Thank you, Alex. Let's give her a hand. But I've really enjoyed working with all of you, the people in this room, and the political team, and the county chairs across the country. It's been the honor of a lifetime to serve as your co-chair, and there's no other team that I'd, that I'd rather fight alongside with than the people in this room. The 168 are the embodiment of what makes our republic the most successful experiment in world history. And it's more than a party, this is a family. The RNC must remain a rock of stability and unity in these uncertain times. This has been a tough year, but it's, what it showed us is if we work together, we can accomplish anything. Teamwork and continuity are how this team broke record after record this cycle, from fundraising to grassroots engagement. We were even able to go 100% virtual in a 24-hour period when the lockdowns began, and that helped allow us to reach more voters in this presidential election cycle than any in history. And we will remain a rock of stability as we fight this unconventional political war against the left. It's imperative that we stay united as a party, and build on the incredible gains we've made, and remain vigilant in this fight. It's crucial that we continue to provide resources to our state parties to attract diverse conservative candidates across the country, as well as add to the millions of new patriots who have joined our grassroots effort this cycle. These are the people who will ensure that we, as a nation, remain the land of opportunity and prosperity for our sons and daughters and theirs in the next generation. What's been accomplished in the last two years? I can tell you that I did what was asked uh, of me in service to the RNC, and I covered a lot of ground as your co-chair. I traveled to 42 states, made 300 stops, and traveled over 220,000 miles. Under my leadership, your co-chair team joined the RNC efforts on knocking on doors across 10 states and phone banked over 30,000 GOTB calls. We understood that the key to being effective was, focus, was being focused on grassroots and GOTB activation, and we did that. We spent time each week calling volunteers across all 50 states and territories because engagement was a priority. I tried to be a servant leader, leading by action like our chairwoman, and personally devoted over 100 hours reaching out to you, the members of the 168. Record fundraising. I've had the privilege to work with Rana and Todd and our great team finance to help lead this effort. As you all well know, funds are the fuel to candidates, to state uh, parties and to GOTV efforts. This cycle, we were a well-oiled machine. Together with the campaign, we raised more money than ever in the history of this great party, and in this non-presidential cycle, we cannot let off the gas. We have to be even more committed to raising funds to fight against the radical left takeover of our elections and our way of life. Over the past two years, I've logged over 600 hours on the phone fundraising and maintaining or growing key donor relationships. I tap my own private sector network of friends and colleagues in key target states to identify new major donors and raise millions of dollars for our party. These past two years, we also saw record grassroots engagement. Our tent has grown, and more importantly, it's as diverse as ever. That's a good thing. We had the resources, we invested wisely, and we must keep this momentum going. We made historic gains in the number of black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Americans who turned out to vote and, and support Republicans in this cycle. Our strategic initiatives team executed over 10,000 events this cycle to reach and train voters, and I was honored to be asked to help in this effort on countless occasions. But we worked with communities and empowered local leaders to train up and engage with traditional and non-traditional GOP voters through our Rising Stars, Grow, and other initiatives. And throughout my stops across the country, I made it a priority to visit our Black Voices uh, community centers and understand, understood that we had to do more in our APA community. To that end, I had listening sessions with APA leaders, 
spoke at several dozen APA events, and did 12 APA-specific interviews. And for the first time in our party's history, I built a relationship with the Brazilian American community in Florida. And guess what? They're here to stay. Oops. <laughs> these coalitions are where the growth of our party will be, and there's lots of enthusiasm in these communities. And it's all for our common cause, which is liberty, freedom, prosperity. Over the past four years, President Trump brought in millions of new grassroots volunteers, voters, and donors to the RNC, and we worked with them and showed them that the GOP was and is their new home. They responded to a bold set of ideas, an inclusive message that included smaller government, criminal justice reform, deregulation, tax cuts, and a bold America First agenda, including standing up to communist China that attracted them to join us and vote with us. As I traveled all over the country, I was inspired by their love of country and their sincere desire to be more engaged with our party. Today, our party is an even better reflection of the beautiful diversity that our nation is because we listened, we gave them a message, and we welcomed them like never before. That is grassroots action. And as Rana noted, a record number of Republican women will serve in this Congress, and it is poetic that they were elected during this 100-year anniversary of women's suffrage. My three daughters can look at Rana, the women in this room, and these great conservative uh, congresswomen and be inspired. And when my children look back at my time of service to the RNC, I want them to be proud. I want them to be proud of the fruits of our labor and know that we were fighting for their future. We also saw record media engagement. We have the best communications and di digital teams in politics. And I got to personally participate in over 160 media hits across 30 states. But every phone call made, every door knocked, and every dollar raised with this team has been a privilege. And now, looking ahead, we must stay the course and fight for liberty and freedom. I agree with Rana and fully support the RNC having an election integrity committee and increasing our capacity to fight these legal challenges on the front end. We must undo the radical Democrat takeover of our election system in America. And it's going to take a lot of money to do that. The GOP has to be unified, and I know we will defeat this great effort by the left to fundamentally change our nation. But we have to stay together, and we will. Lastly, I want to make something abundantly clear about the issue of impartiality and remaining neutral during our future presidential election cycle. I, like all of you, understand the RNC rules and know that you all will join me in remaining neutral so that the people of our party can decide who our next candidate will be at the appropriate time. We all know a lot of fantastic leaders uh, in our party that are rumored to be running in 2024, and we must remain impartial. The world's future depends on a free and stable United States of America and a very strong, vibrant, inclusive, and successful Republican Party. And I know every person in this room is committed to fighting each and every day together to ensure we preserve our nation's future. Thank you all for the good and very important work that you all do for our, our party and our great republic. God bless you all. God bless this party. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tommy. Now it is time for the treasurer's report. It is my pleasure to introduce Ron Kaufman to give his report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, I want to second your endorsement of how great a staff you've all put together, even Richard, uh, at the RNC. It's stunning. You know, um, I'm blessed to have a house five blocks from the RNC, and I spend 30 to 40 hours a week uh, in the building. And if I go there on a Monday morning at 9 or a Wednesday night at 10 or even a Friday at 8 or a Sunday at, at 4, uh, the building is humming. And it's people who are working for us every single day for very little reward other than the love of the committee and love of the party and love of the president. So it's an honor for me to be uh, the treasurer and see all this um, fabulous work done by the staff of the RNC. 
Uh, and particularly, I want to thank Josh Fisher, who's our CFO, and the staff of 11 people uh, who work in the treasurer's office uh, to make sure that the, the 1.6 million pieces of FEC report that go in each year are 100% correct. Uh, we're blessed, despite the fact we raised $1.3 billion that went through the system, we only had 10 minor FEC questions. It was one, it, it, all 10 of them were about great little donors who get texts every other day for money, and they all give to every text, and they go over the limit. So we have a great, terrific record with the FEC, and our auditors consider us the gold standard of any corporation, not just a political corporation, but any billion dollar corporation in America, and I'm proud to be a part of it all. And uh, we're spending a lot of money, time, and effort with that team and with legal to make sure that every dime that goes through that process is correctly spent, wisely spent, and complies with our corporate um, contribution limits, and more importantly, that every contract is honored as written. Uh, in addition to that, um, it's just a fabulous honor to be there, and uh, I appreciate the fact that I've been able to be a treasurer these last two years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ron. I'd like to ask Doyle Webb, RNC General Counsel, to deliver the General Counsel's report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, you can work it in both ways that way. An abbreviated counsel's report, as you know, counsel's office has been very busy during the general election. Uh, we've worked with Republican campaigns to help ensure any issues with the elections were brought to light fully and investigated and litigated where necessary. Counsel's office is continuing to work with our state parties and sister committees to support Republican candidates uh, throughout the country. This fight is not over. Matter of fact, it has just begun. The RNC will continue to assist the coming in the coming months and years to ensure that all states enact and uphold election integrity laws that enable every American to have full faith in our election results. The Council's office is also engaged with our states and our state parties in working with state legislatures, in redistricting of legislative districts and congressional districts that will be important to us for the next decade. Madam Chairman, I, this is probably my last report. I appreciate the confidence that you have shown in me. I want to say that you are truly a wonderful spokesman for the Republican Party, and the greatest compliment I can give you is that you're a great spokesman for Republican women that can tell the Democrats to go to hell and they look forward to the trip. Thank you. Thank you, Doyle. I love Doyle's reports, but that was a special one, so thank you so much. Uh, we will now move on to uh, committee reports, beginning with the Resolutions Committee. I would like to ask Kyle Hupfer, State Party Chair for Indiana, uh, to deliver his report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Pursuant to Rule Number 10A2 of the Rules of the Republican Party, the Standing Committee on Resolutions met this week to consider all resolutions timely submitted to the committee. Copies of the resolutions were emailed to all members. Madam Chair, 10 resolutions were submitted to the committee, and the committee recommends 10 resolutions for adoption today. They are Resolution Honoring the Life of Republican National Committee Woman Lily Nunez, Resolution Honoring the Life of Alabama Republican Party Chief of Staff Harold Sox, Resolution Honoring the Life of the Honorable Harold Roger Jones, Resolution Ensuring the People's Constitutional Right to a Fair, Legal, and Accurate Election, Resolution commending the unprecedented accomplishment of President Trump in his first term. Resolution thanking Trump supporters and grassroots volunteers across the nation. Resolution urging Congress to curb big tech's censorship. 
Resolution encouraging universities across the United States to teach traditional journalism and objective, fact-based reporting. Resolution supporting the Keep Nine Amendment to the United States Constitution. Resolution honoring the life of Flo Chrisman Nair Trawick. In the interest of time, I request that the rules be suspended to admit the reading of these resolutions. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Now, without objection, we will vote on the resolutions as a whole. Kyle. Madam Chair, this concludes my report, and I now move that the 10 resolutions before the committee be adopted as a whole. The motion has been made to adopt the 10 resolutions as a whole. Is there a second? The motion is moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Madam Chairman. <clears throat> sure, yes, Richard Porter. Uh, I rise with a heavy heart uh, because I've learned this morning that Brian Sicknick, a Capitol Police officer, died of injuries sustained during the, uh, the riot that occurred at our nation's capital. And I just would like to ask all of our fellow members to stand for a moment of silence and, uh, and say a prayer for him and for his family and to say a prayer generally supporting our police officers. We've had a year of political violence, which is inexcusable. And we, as the Republican Party, stand with the police officers. We are the party of law and order. And we want to say our prayer of thanks to the police officers and sorrow for the loss of Officer Sicknick. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for doing that. And thank you all for joining in that moment of silence. Hearing no further discussion, we will move to a vote on the adoption of the 10 resolutions as a whole. All of those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, signify by saying no. The ayes have it, and the 10 resolutions are adopted. Thank you, Kyle. I would now like to recognize Budget Committee Chairman Glenn McCall, Nash Committee Man for South Carolina, for the purpose of giving the Budget Committee report. Glenn. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, at first, I'd like to thank the Budget Committee uh, members for their commitment and dedication uh, and work to bring before you uh, today our 2021 RNC budget. And uh, if you'd just give me a, a minute or two, uh, Madam Chair. I would uh, especially, and not only I, but the entire budget committee would like to uh, thank our chief of staff, Richard Walters, our COO, Tina Jackson, CFO, Josh Fisher, member services director, uh, Mariana Herrera, and the entire leadership team of uh, the RNC for their, their patience, work, commitment to ensure when we come to December, uh, uh, each year that everything is laid out, we can be efficient, get things done uh, in an orderly fashion to bring our budget each January to this committee. So Madam Chair, without any further ado, this concludes my report and I move the adoption of the 2021 RNC budget. Glenn McCall has moved adoption of the 2021 RNC budget. Do I hear a second? It is moved and seconded that we adopt the 2021 RNC budget. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, we will proceed with the vote. All those in favor of adopting the 2021 RNC budget, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, signify by saying no. The ayes have it, and the 2021 RNC budget is adopted. Thank you, Glenn. Before we move on to officer elections, I do want to personally thank all of our officers, Doyle, Vicki, Ron, everybody who served as committee chairs, uh, our finance chair, you have done such amazing, uh, such amazing work. And I just appreciate you all so much and your dedication to our party, your sacrifice, your love of this committee. And uh, I hope you all know how hard they work. And thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now we will proceed with the election of RNC officers and I will begin by providing a brief overview of the election process. RNC officer elections are governed by rule number 5B, which reads, the chairman, co-chairman, and all other officers shall be elected in January of each odd numbered year. All officers except the vice chairman shall be nominated from the floor and shall have at least the majority vote of the Republican National Committee members in each of three states in order to have their names placed into nomination. 
Evidenced by written documentation submitted to the Council's Office, only one candidate received the necessary support from each of these states for the elections of Chairman and Secretary. Four candidates received the necessary support for the election of Co-Chairman, and two candidates received the necessary support for the election of Treasurer. Elections shall be held in the following order, Chairman, Co-Chairman, Treasurer, and Secretary. Each candidate will be allotted five minutes total for nominating, nominating and seconding speeches, and the Council's Office will keep time. Council's Office will hold up a green card when the one minute is remaining, when one minute is remaining, and a red card when time is expired. Time limits will be strictly enforced. Nominating speeches and seconding, seconding speeches will be made from the microphones on the floor. Only the members or valid proxy holders nominating and seconding the candidates will be allowed to speak. In the five minute, when the five minute time limit has expired, or if it has expired, and additional members wish to second the nomination, those members will be able to approach the council's off, uh, council office's table and add their names. When the nomination for an office has ended, the chair will repeat the names in nomination. Although Robert's Rules of Order allows the chair to declare a candidate elected when he or she is the only nominee for an office, the membership will have an opportunity for a vote on each candidate. In these cases, instead of conducting a voice vote, which would make it difficult to ascertain whether only members and proxy are voting, we will conduct the elections by standing vote for the offices with which there is only one nominee. If you are voting by proxy in addition to your own vote, please hold up your proxy card while standing. For elections with more than one nominee, we will vote by secret ballot. As soon as a nominee receives a majority of the votes cast, he or she will be declared elected. Blank ballots and abstentions will not count as votes. If no candidate receives a majority vote, we will stand at ease for five minutes and then vote again until a candidate has a majority. After each election, the elected officer will have the opportunity to briefly address the body. We will begin with the election of Chairman of the Republican National Committee. Without objection, I would like to now hand the gavel to Jeff Kent, National Committee Man for Washington and Rules Committee Chairman, for the purpose of presiding over the Chairman election. Hearing no objection, Jeff Kent will now preside. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the easiest duty at the podium today because only one candidate for chairman has demonstrated the required support for nomination, Ronna McDaniel. The chair recognizes Shir Shirlene Ostroff, state chairman for Hawaii, for the purpose of making the nomination. Shirlene. I rise to nominate Ronna McDaniel. Ronna McDaniel has been nominated, and because there are no other nominations that qualify under rule number 5B, nominations are now closed. Shirlene, would you like to speak to the nomination? I would. I have the distinct honor of uh, nominating Ronna McDaniel for the position of chairman of the Republican uh, National Committee. Um, I served uh, in uniform in combat for more than 20 years, and this commitment is, I think, just as important as those who serve in uniform. And I know that I would follow my commander, uh, Rana, into battle, and I think that she would be in the foxhole or my wingman any day, and that's why this is so important to do. Chairman McDaniel has been a steadfast partner and champion for the Republican Party and President Trump, this committee, and the American people. She's worked tirelessly to grow the Republican Party as we all know, reach out to new voters, hold Democrats and media accountable, we've all seen it, um, and ensure that the party has the resources needed to uh, compete and succeed. And under Chairman McDaniel's leadership, the RNC built the biggest infrastructure and ground game in political history and helped to deliver countless victories on election day. And under Chairman McDaniel's leadership, our party expanded our coalitions with women veterans and minorities of which I have been very grateful to watch and participate in. Under Chairman McDaniel's leadership, we saw victories up and down the ballot on election day. There are more victories to come, I'm sure, for the party, and I am confident that Chairman McDaniel is the leader to help us in 2021, 2022, and beyond. 
Chairman McDaniel is a fierce messenger for our party, and her passion for this job shines through every day. Chairman McDaniel is a fierce, um, she truly cares about each state, territory, and community, and I know this because she and Richard Walters came all the way out to Hawaii. They were exhausted, and uh, they came out and spent time to help me build and extend my party. And in true uh, Native Hawaiian fashion, I offer, I would like to offer a small uh, gift to Rana in the way of an oli or a Native Hawaiian chant. And this chant, so everybody knows, is a simple gesture, but it's given in these kinds of things to focus energies of the people so that they can pull out their kuleana or their responsibility. So if I may, on behalf of Hawaii, Ohoa ia kamaka loa la, pua ike aloha la, kuka ia kaha loa la, pavehi mai na lehua, mai kai ho o kua ika hala va ila, mahalo ena akua, mahalo ena kupuna la ea, mahalo meke aloha la. I am confident. In Chairman McDaniel's leadership, I'm so proud to nominate her, and I recognize Glenn McCall for the purpose of seconding this nomination. Mahalo. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> it's with great pleasure that I rise to second the nomination of Ronna McDaniel for election as chairman of the Republican National Committee. As a committee, what we ask of our chairman is to represent us in excellence in three areas. Uh, one is public relations, their public relation role. We ask them to be a prolific fundraiser. And thirdly, to build a world-class organization. Chairwoman McDaniel is an articulate, dynamic representative of our party and our party values each and every day. And I think we all can uh, contest to that. A prolific fundraiser, uh, a lot of you may not know, uh, Chairwoman McDaniel has set records month over month, but most importantly, she has raised, uh, she and her finance team, over $1.3 billion, and she raised that in 48 months, where her predecessor took 72 months to raise a billion dollars. So she's a prolific fundraiser for our party, and we have raised at least $1 million for 270, probably 78 now, consecutive days. So we, we thank her, and she's lived up to, to, to that. And finally, she's built a world-class organization. She and uh, our chief of staff, Richard Walters. We have, as you heard yesterday and we've seen meeting after meeting, the great work of our online efforts, our digital efforts, our analytics, and, uh, and of course, our strategic uh, activities uh, were, or evidence this election cycle. So I hereby second the nomination of Ronna McDaniel for election as chair of the Republican National Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. The nomination of Ronna McDaniel for chairman of the Republican National Committee has been moved and seconded. We will now move to a vote. The question is on the election of Ronna McDaniel as chairman of the Republican National Committee. All those in favor, please stand and remain standing. Please be seated. All those opposed, Please stand and remain standing. Is it necessary? Please be seated. So the ayes have it. Ronna McDaniel is elected chairman of the Republican National Committee. Madam Chair, also lovingly known as Scooter McDaniel, congratulations. The podium is once again yours. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I, I was so emotional hearing Charlene. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. And Glenn, thank you all um, for your support and confidence. I am humbled uh, and I am privileged and I promise I will work as hard as I can to earn your trust and faith in me. I want to thank my family again. Patrick, once again, back there, my amazing, handsome husband. Abigail and Nash, who could care less that their mom's the chair of the RNC. Um, and, and everybody for the endless love and support. Uh, obviously, President Trump uh, and, and all of those who supported me. Uh, you know, I think about President Trump submitting my name at the beginning, and I remember thinking, I was a mom making peanut butter and jelly like four years before that, or two years before that. I was a stay-at-home mom. And there's not many people who would say, let's take that woman, a mom from Michigan, and have her run the national party. And I think that says a lot about his support of women, and I've certainly been encouraged and supported by him. <laughs> Our amazing chief of staff, Richard, uh, the leadership of the committee, none of this would be possible without you. And I'm so humbled and honored to have this opportunity to do this again. And thank you to all of you. I just love you all. I have so enjoyed talking to you the past months and learning from you. And I promise you, promise you, and I'm looking at Harmeet when I say this, I won't let you down. I won't. I listen to everything you said. And I want to promise the grassroots of our party. We hear you. We hear your frustration. We know that you want us as the Republican National Committee to fight to make sure our elections are fair and free and transparent. And we are going to come out of this with a mission, a mission to go to our state legislators, to go to our leaders, and make sure that what we saw in this election never happens again, that poll watchers are allowed to observe, that we put meaningful voter ID laws in the books, and that we make sure that every American, because it is vital to our democracy, that every American has faith in our election process. We are going to tackle the debate committee. We're going to make sure that we continue to engage our grassroots, and we are going to work harder and stronger, together, united, every Republican. Let's strip away the labels, and let's make sure we work as one party, one group, to get rid of socialism and fight for democracy and the greatest nation on earth, the United States of America. And together, we will win in 2022 and take back the House and take back the Senate. And let's send Nancy Pelosi home once and for all for good. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we have some other elections to do, and we will proceed with the RNC co-chairman election. The chair will remind the body that the rule number 5A1 states a chairman and co-chairman of the opposite sex so shall be elected by the members of the Republican National Committee. The council's office, on behalf of the secretary, has confirmed that four candidates for co-chairman have demonstrated the required support for nomination. The order of nominations was decided by a random drawing. We will now begin. The chair recognizes John Hammond, National Committee Man for Indiana, from Indiana, for the purpose of nominating a candidate for RNC co-chairman. This is proven to be a barrier to my. Oh yeah, can we get the mic? So I'm good. I'm good. So. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is John Hammond. I'm the National Committeeman for Indiana. I rise as a proud Midwesterner to nominate Jay Shepard for the office of co-chair of the Republican National Committee. Jay is best known to all of us for his passion and sacred care for our Republican Party. Jay's total commitment to our party is evidenced by his decades of real grassroots and party organization experience. He's done it all, done it all. From GOP town chair to county chair to the Vermont Republican State Committee to national committeeman to the RNC Rules Committee and as a trusted member of the RNC Executive Committee, those are great accomplishments <clears throat> and valuable to this body. All along the way, Jay has earned a reputation for unfailing integrity.